Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Istanbul. Welcome to Swada. And welcome to the Audi Urban Future Award 2012. My name is Heinrich Wefing. I'm an editor of Die Zeit Weekly in Germany. And it is an honor for me to guide you through this evening. I'm also very happy that many of you have arrived here. And if you've been aboard, then you probably enjoyed this uh, charming and fascinating boat trip. It was a pleasure. I'm very happy that you have arrived. I'm very happy that Robert Stadler is here, the CEO of Audi AG, and other members of the board of Audi. I'm happy that John Sicara and the members of the jury of the Audi Urban Future Award are here as well. And I'm happy that Christian Gertner is here and his time of Style Park. These are the curators of the award this year. And surely I'm happy that you are here and that the architects are here. That is the five contestants of the Audi Urban Future Award. And we are going to see who the winner will be. Well, the winner has been determined already, but we are not going to tell you right now. We would like to, you know, hold uh, uh, not to, to divulge the information right away. But nevertheless, I would like to mention the five participating architecture offices. One, Superpool from Istanbul. It's the CRIT office from Mumbai, India. And Node Architecture and Urbanism, Pearl River Delta from China. And the Urban Think Tank, Sao Paulo. And Howler Yoon from Boston in the United States of America. Well, most of you have seen the presentation. You know, five outstanding projects, five fascinating offices. And I do not really envy the, in the jury that they had to choose from these five. And as you can hear, I'm talking in German. We've got simultaneous uh, interpretation into English and Turkish. Well, actually, you should see which channels are used for which language. But I think it is very easy for you to find out yourselves. And because this is a completely global event, we are going to change to English later so that this will turn into a really international evening like the architects are, like this award is. Now, ladies and gentlemen, before we announce the winner, I would like to introduce to you and announce the first speaker, the chairman of the board of management of Audi AG, Mr. Rupert Stadler. And please give him a big hand. Welcome him. Ladies and gentlemen, without Rupert Stadler, and I don't think that this is an exaggeration, we would not be here this evening. Right from scratch, right from the outset, he supported the Audi Urban Future Awards. And I'm very happy that he really took the trouble to come to Istanbul today because he has to leave immediately, go back to Germany right away. And therefore, we are particularly happy that he's here and is going to give a short presentation. You have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a wonderful good evening. Now, we at Audi and our partners at the Audi Urban Future Award, we have come here today to draw up the specifications for the city of the future. And to me, this evening, is much more than the presentation of an award. Everything that the five participating architectural firms submitted to us as a jury was fascinating, absolutely fascinating, no doubt about it. But this is about much more. Now, for me, this is about 
a concrete blueprint today, a concrete will route to Urbanity 3.0, as we call it. After the first award, 2010, some people said to us, well, it's all fine and dandy, you have nice ideas here, but all of these ideas are a little bit too abstract, don't you think so? Now, this was certainly an important piece of advice. The winning design of this year's competition will be presented to you in just a few minutes. And we decided that this winning design in the coming months, starting today, will be further developed. We will develop it into a so-called city dossier. Now, a city dossier analyzes and assesses a city from a societal perspective, from a technical perspective, and also in terms of space available in a city. And ultimately, we expect this to provide an impulse for long-term practice-based projects. This dossier is going to provide concrete instructions on how to plan a city, how to reshape and redefine a city in order to respond to the following challenges. Increasing urbanization, which means reduce quality of air, more smog, more traffic, more noise, and at the same time, less and less space for ourselves. Now, we are experiencing a global trend towards an increase in urban density. In 2010, for the very first time worldwide, more people have been living in the cities than in rural areas. And by 2030, a good 5 billion people will be living in cities, compared to only 3.5 billion people living in rural areas. And as a consequence, conurbations will become larger and larger and more densely populated. In China, there are already more than 40 cities with more than one million inhabitants, and worldwide we have 10 metropolises in which even more than 10 million people live. And well, after Mexico, Shanghai and Beijing, Istanbul occupies number four, rank four of the list of megacities of our planet. Some time ago, I spent a couple of days on vacation with my wife here in this city, and I realized immediately that we have to invite you to this city for the presentation of the award. So why am I so fascinated by this city, particularly by this city, Istanbul? Because it's simply a city of many contrasts. On the one hand, there is a maze of historical, narrow, winding alleys and lanes. And on the other hand, we have an international transport hub. We have airports, bus stations, we have motorways, and we have seaports. So on the one hand, we have wonderful mosques and villas and palaces. And on the other hand, we have skyscrapers in the Levant business district and so on. Now, to sum it up, it's an old city with a long tradition with 2,600 years of history and at the same time with the largest population of young people, more young people than in any other large city in Europe. This is a meeting place, a meeting place for concepts, for cultures and even for entire continents. And obviously, people here know how to successfully blend and reconcile opposites, or at least to avoid clashes between opposites. The bridge over the Bosporus is a powerful symbol of this. Well, it connects Europe and Asia and only for 40 years has this connection existed. So um which other location would be more suitable for building um new bridges, for talking about the cities of the future? This is an excellent location, this melting pot with more than 13 million inhabitants. In the Audi Urban Future Award, it's the sheer diversity and the different facets of the mobility concepts from the large metropolitan areas of this planet, which gives it a unique charm, which makes it so exciting, because no two cities are alike. In the run-up to this prize presentation ceremony, we as a jury studied five different proposals for sustainable mobility in the year 2030, and all of them were extraordinary.
The architecture firm Superpool from Istanbul thought about a system of co-determination via social networks so that um, city planning, urban planning becomes more democratic. And Superpool also supports the idea of breathing new life into public spaces, reviving public spaces by pushing back and reducing the infrastructure. The architects from Crits in the Indian city of Mumbai defined an integrated mobility concept, which comprises people, goods, energy and data. Urban space is something they want to shape on the basis of a fair reconciliation of interests between the social, among the social classes in Mumbai. And they also designed a couple of tools for this purpose. Ultimately, the idea is to increase quality of life. Now, the node office or firm in the Chinese Pearl River Delta wants to create an equilibrium, a balance between industrial production, natural resources and new quality of life. Human beings should be the focus of attention. Streets should serve as public space and they should network people, connect people both virtually and in real life. The urban think tank from Sao Paulo in Brazil as the fourth group, they thought in every direction. They thought about traffic on the streets, underground, in the air, and the architects also looked at transport modes covering different lengths of hall and merged all of them with each other. And they also demonstrated how mobility can above all, overcome social borders, and how, all in all, a new feeling of life, a new lifestyle can be developed, which is based upon new forms of mobility. And Hola Yoon architecture from Boswash, the economic area of Boston and Washington, presented to us how one can eliminate the separation between the city and its suburbs, how urban wasteland can be better utilized, also to grow food for the region, and how to communicate communicate in a more flexible and efficient manner, and how travel times can be turned into a special experience. Now, I'm not going to tell you who the winner is. I'm certainly not going to tell you this, but I'm happy to tell you why we, as an automotive manufacturer, commit ourselves to increasing the quality of life in the cities. We want to make it higher quality of life in the cities and we want to assist in organizing urban life. I'm going to tell you why we do it. Because if you permanently strive for progress, you also have to have the courage to rethink time and again and to question conventional wisdom. And that's the very core and essence of our corporate culture. We at Audi have always been pioneers, searching for new ways. We've always been ambitious enough to expand our leads day by day. We want to really expand our lead, want to be pioneers. And that's why with the Audi Urban Future Initiative, we have been striking unusual, mostly new paths for three years now. Our commitment to us is part of our corporate responsibility of what we are as a company. A city should not be home to problems, but it should be a home to people. It should be a place where we experience a high quality of life and it should provide a vital stimulus for our society. At first glance, it might seem quite unusual for an automotive company to look into cities and urban structures and to study these. But of course, we want to learn from this. Or it might also look unusual, or sound unusual, when an automotive company thinks or actively thinks about and um, discusses the mobility questions of the future. But it, is it really unusual to look beyond the confines of your own product range and if you want to really understand what it's all about? You know, urban mobility should also be enjoyable in the future. It should be an enjoyable experience. We are looking at cities. We are looking at mobility, not only from a technological perspective, but also from a sociological and a cultural perspective. In this process, we want to try to pool knowledge, to connect different worlds, and of course, to network people. The bridge over the Bosporus is a good example of the fact that it's people 
who are needed here, people who think out of the box, who are courageous enough to create something new, people who can get others to share their visions and ideas, even if these visions and ideas are extraordinary and unusual. This is the only way to create really trailblazing, groundbreaking innovations. For more than three years, I have been a sponsor of the Audi Urban Future Initiative, and it's been a great joy for me. And during these years, I've come to the conclusion that mobility is the big picture. You have to think of the big picture. You have to see it from a different perspective. You also have to see it from the perspective of the sociologist and urban planners. And complex questions have to be reflected upon. For instance, what social tensions are created as a result of the emerging middle class in Mumbai? So what do we learn from the mobility solutions that the poorest people living in Sao Paulo have come up with? Or how do social media influence life here in this city, in Istanbul? In our company, we are treating insights from these and other questions in an open and systematic manner. We initiate changes and we permanently challenge our own actions. And this gives us vital impulses for new success, success that we can achieve in the future. In the context of the Audi Urban Future Initiative, we also share our knowledge with others, for instance, with the architects that participated in this year's award competition. This is a kind of experiment, and I believe it's really quite unique. No other company has ever undertaken such an experiment. Who else but us would grant third parties access to the insights gained in technological development? But we ventured on this journey into the unknown, and this has been a great success and a great joy for our company. Now, ladies and gentlemen, many of us dwell and work and live in cities. And this is why we have to learn how to understand these cities, their particular features and characteristics. And if you like, we have to understand the basic principle of operation of cities. We have to understand how they work. And of course, we have to understand and learn about the expectations of the people who live in these cities. In spite of the trend towards globalization, the large cities have a high degree of local identity. And this is why there is no universal blueprint for the city of the future. There is no universal concept. And what applies to the city also applies to future mobility. These challenges, challenges of future mobility, cannot be solved by anyone on their own, not by a single government or a single company or social network. We have to team up, we have to cooperate across disciplines, and then we can identify and generate new impulses. And this is why we are very happy that we gained Mark Wigley as our partner for the Audi Urban Future Initiative. It's a great joy for us as a dean of the architecture faculty of the renowned Columbia University, he founded a think tank which together with Audi looks at the future of cities in a scientific way. And it goes far beyond the learnings of contemporary urban research. He has a project that looks at asymmetric mobility and at a mix of different formal and informal types of mobility. And this is what we also observe in Istanbul, how this works can be seen in Istanbul on a daily basis. And such developments will definitely be used as a basis to further rethink the concept of cities for the future. We no longer think of the year 2030, but we think decades beyond that date. Nobel Prize winners and lawyers and traffic experts in this think tank radically rethink cities and mobility. Their objective is to develop 10 hypotheses concerning 10 relevant topics Mark for Wigley the cities of the future. So Mark Wigley stands for deconstructivism in architecture. And this, well, line of this um, de deconstructivism develops new forms and structures and identifies instabilities. The insights which we have gained over the past three years with our initiative will also be used in this project. So we see ourselves as an important interface between visionary approaches on the one hand and also the mundane reality of our business world on the other hand.
A great help in this context is Christian Gärtner, who is director of Stein Park AG, because in our competition he helps us as a curator, and he's going to come to the stage in a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, what would the world be without visions? Now just for a moment, think of Atlantis. Well, it used to be an island with a distinctive rural character, and then it developed into a major naval power. Plato gave a detailed description of Atlantis. He said it's large, with abundant mineral resources and precious metals. They harvest two crops per year. And he said the buildings are arranged in an annular pattern around the center. They have an ingenious system of waterways. To put it in a nutshell, Plato said that Atlantis was perfect. There's just one problem about the story with Atlantis. Nobody really knows today whether Atlantis ever existed or whether it was just a myth. So let's not look for the perfect city. Let's focus on the strengths of our cities instead. Let's rediscover the historical roots of our cities. Cities used to be a place where people used to communicate much more than today. So let's make cities a place again where people want to live, where they can really enjoy living. And then all of us will enjoy the city of the future. Thank you. Thank you, Herr Thank you very much, Mr. Stadler, for your introductory words. And you announce the next speaker. Christian Gerda is going to give you the next speaker. He is the CEO of Style Park AG from Frankfurt. He's losing his mic at this moment, but doesn't matter. Style Park is the curator of the Audi Urban Future initiatives. And at the same time, they also will present the prize today. I'm going to continue to talk until Christian is you know, finished everything. Christian, you have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, Mr. Stadler. I would like to start my speak with the two evidently simple questions, and you mentioned them in your speech as well, and they are the beginning of our joint travel. Where are we going? And how do we get there? You see, it's not my intention now to embark, embark on a philosophical discourse. No, it is all about talking about or rather making us aware of the increasing complexity when it comes to answering these questions. To make things simple, let us start with the practical level, that is, the modes of transport. I can imagine very well that some of you have traveled here and it was a very diverse journey. Starting with a plane, using a taxi, maybe using a streetcar or a tram, and at the end, you took a boat. But no matter how you arrived here, we, or all of us, had a common goal, which we wanted to reach as conveniently as is possible, and I believe it was quite spectacular today, but we also want to reach it, reach our destination efficiently. But we are not talking about the physical modes of transport alone, who were with us while traveling to Istanbul. This route was aligned from different uh, built-up areas. We have been linked with all of the world using our electronic assistance while we were moving through specific areas. And of course, we also were traveling along changing parameters again and again. In other words, we are not talking about a linear movement from A to B, but we have a high frequency of, the, of uh, many, many transactions which allowed us and enabled us to handle these formal and informal structures of an urban area. So you may say that a city doesn't only demand mobility, but the city itself becomes mobility. And our picture of a city as an agglomeration of built-up structures is now facing the invisible, the volatile, 
and the mobility inherent in it. And consistently, we consider ourselves as a part of an intricate and far-developed network of movements and motions which creates new requirements and uh, needs and possibilities. We may assume and that people, that most people will live in cities. And here we can say that the city will turn from a threatening, problematic uh, entity to a positive, dynamic place whose potentials are inexhaustible. The sociologist Saskia Sesson says that we have to learn to listen to a city in order to understand its added value. And Mark Wigley's idea of the extreme city, and of course the, his colleague's ideas, that is, it is a bit more of a city and we should uh, accept the generous offerings given. And I believe that all this is pointing in the right direction. I think it is a fact. Cities will continue to grow. But how they will look like in future, that's something which we cannot say or forecast with any uh, measure of certainty. We can only say that the space or the area which we live in will not be the same in future. And this is exactly what Audi AG in its role as an enabler of mobility recognized and then embarked on or embraced this uh, uh, seemingly balmy but basically very far-sighted initiatives to identify and serve future mobility needs and requirements that's a remit this is a task which cannot be dealt with today alone here and now but it is in, uh, entrenched in an ongoing process you see therefore we believe it was a very conscious uh, decision to deal with these modes of transport and it underlines Audi's obligation not, a, not only to be a trailblazer when it comes to innovation but also when it comes to mobility in the future in all its facets and nuances. The new role which a car will play in the highly complex urban area is not considered to be or is not interpreted as a problem by us, but is considered to be a solution which may open new options for us in future. Now, how do we move? How do we get there? The task which we face changes between local and global needs and requirements. These are our needs. These are the needs of people who live in different and varying spaces. Now, which kind of space can we offer? which harnesses the chances of mobilities which cross each other. The approach was to link architecture, urbanism, theoretic academic discourses and mobility with a company and to shape this urban future. And this is the reason why the Urban Future Award and the Urban Future Initiative was given life. And this meant that uh, the group has internal and external expert networks and they use them to give impetus and incentives to others. We as curators have got the task to identify these networks, to activate them and to link them with Audi. Now let us have a look at the network of this award. Mr. Stadler introduced uh, to you the architecture offices and I do not want to repeat these concepts. But permit me to underline again that the selected cities and regions have uh, provided decisive laboratory situations for the dialogue between architecture, mobility concepts, as well as urban planning. They embody the places of the future in which density, formal versus informal, and transaction capacities of a very new kind have or are being dealt with to a great extent. The offices selected for this award are experts in their region and they are characterized by the fact that they've made significant local contributions. Based on an exact analysis of existing mobilities and the general conditions, in the next step we had a, a debate or discussion about the question of individual mobility within major, larger mobility complexes. 
The objective was, like the Chinese curator said, that is, we want to find translocal scenarios which identifies local uh, particularities and identify transformative interventions. And this is what the architecture office achieved. It is all speaking for themselves. We are not talking about crazy ideas. No, we see ideas which are an indicator that it is not so absurd to turn what seems to be impossible into something which is possible. Here, at this point, I'd like to thank all the participants and contestants and their teams for their hard work, for their exact analysis, and the patience when dealing with us, the feeling or the sense, rather, for innovation and the courage to word or define a vision. I'd like to thank them for all this work. They are courageous because uh, they've become vulnerable. I believe this is a very important um, feature. I also like to thank the other partners of the Urban Future Initiatives, in particular Lisa Phillips, director of the New Museum New York and her inspiring Ideas City Istanbul program, or to Mark Wigley, dean of the School of Architecture of the Columbia, Columbia University, and we have been working with him and his team in other specific projects. I'd like to thank the organizers of the event that we can attend this meeting. And I'd like to thank you, Mr. Stadley and Audi AG, that you always embark on, say, crazy, balmy ideas, and that you believe in big ideas which could be implemented. And I'd like to thank the jury. They've been working since 7 a.m. this morning. John, we are really interested in your statement. Thank you. Vielen Dank, Christian Gartner. Ladies and gentlemen, now is the time to switch into English. You can take your headphones off and turn them on. Um, it is my distinct pleasure and my privilege to introduce to you John Thakara, the head of the jury for the Audio Urban Future Award 2012. Join me on the podium. Good to see you. Thank you very much. The stage is yours. Ten minutes and one more suit to go, and then one table here will be very happy. I have a short text to read. Driving a two-ton sport utility vehicle to collect a 300-gram pizza to feed a gorgeous 20-kilogram daughter may seem normal enough now, but to our children, when they are old enough to drive, it will sound like madness. They'll be shocked by our selfish and greedy use of space, matter, energy, and land, just to move around. They'll grieve in particular at the extent to which our unchecked mobility damaged the biosphere, which, after all, is our only home. So let us just for a moment put ourselves in our children's shoes and repose this question. Is mobility a basic human right, a universal need to which we have no choice but to concede? The statement sounds tremendously normal and democratic, but also you could think of it this way. One could say that locusts have a universal need for lunch, and they do. It's nature's way. But look what happens when locusts fulfill their needs. The land is stripped bare, the plants die, and the locusts, who've eaten their last lunch, die out. Our approach collectively to mobility and the systems that support it has been somewhat locust-like for a hundred years or more. We've consumed space, time, energy and resources if they were limitless when they're not. And the price to pay is the series of challenges and questions that we've been facing in this uh, competition and challenge. Many of you I know have seen the exhibition, but I was very struck by one of the videos from Shenzhen. A Chinese man, a young guy, is carrying a tiny baby in his arms and he says to the camera, oh, it's a terrible feeling to walk in the city. And I was thinking, this is 
the center of the world economy. Why is it a terrible feeling for a man and a baby to walk around his own town? 20% after all, 20 to 40% of all the time spent traveling, even today, is walking or waiting. 40% on average. And yet here's this man telling us that walking around his own city is insupportable. It's not just in China, of course. We also saw a film from Istanbul, your city here, a man trying to push a baby in a pushchair along a narrow pavement in a rather unpleasant looking snowstorm. There's some trash bags on the pavement and he can't avoid the trash bags in his pram because there's a line of parked cars prevents him from going into the street. And parked, motionless, large, expensive cars sitting there doing nothing except to prevent this man from moving with his child across the city. In the US it's even crazier, of course. There are six times more parking spaces in the US than there are people. Six times. That's two billion bits of land concreted over, ready to be occupied by large, heavy objects that are used at most for 5% of the time. It's an insane use of space. We've gotten into this difficulty because we've elevated our imagined need for mobility above more fundamental aspects of what it means to live equitably and well. Food, shelter, caring for each other, connecting and transacting with each other, breathing the same air, these are the basic needs. Mobility is a second order question. It's a means to an end. It's not an end in itself, or at least not on its own. On what basis do I say this, particularly in this context? Well, perhaps because nature told me, or nature through some of her spokespersons. Nature, with the experience of 3.8 billion years of trial and error designed to draw on, uh, does not stand still. Of course, nature changes constantly. What nature does not do is drive huge vehicles to collect pizzas from down the road. Only human beings do that. Or, in the immortal words of Janine Benyus that many of you will know, nature does not commute to work. So, what are we to do? How are we to reconnect with this common sense observation about the natural way to organize our inhabitation of this planet? It's not about bad guys doing wicked deeds, well, a bit now and then, but in general, nobody set out to create this mobility mess. All of us, I think, rich and poor, powerful and less powerful, the excluded and the persons on top, have values in common that can be a place to sort of reconsider and reconfigure the discussions amongst us. The appreciation for formal and informal transactions, the necessity that we all have to work in formal and informal market and non-market contexts. But just the social quality of diversity, nobody wants to remove diversity consciously. The need for security in gated uh, and, pa and padlocked communities, for the most part that's because of imagined fears that are the direct social consequence of a breakdown in discourse and communication. All our cities, pretty much without exception, are bedeviled by division and separation amongst the people who know best about what they need, the people who live in them. Does this mean that the forces of development are out of control? Absolutely not. I think the kind of significance of our work today in this whole project is that we are recognizing for the first time after decades of pretending that, oh, we didn't do it, actually we did do it. Everything that happens out there that we regret or that is causing us difficulty is the response of actions or possibly inactions that we are responsible for. The missing element is a new way for cities to think about themselves, to imagine collectively the kind of priorities in terms of the disposition of space and time and resources. The need to do this reflectively and openly in ways that are very, very prepared with the same precision as we currently prepare technical infrastructures. And that's where the Audi Urban Futures Award comes in. It was because the organizers, and we celebrate this, uh, wanted us to think in a holistic way, and by we I mean the competing design teams and also the jury in our conversations, uh, that they did not fill our jury with technocrats and petrol heads. 
Our number included architects and mobility experts, of course, but they were not a majority. Our number included a writer, an apprentice in permaculture, a curator, a service designer, a demographer, and a philosopher. That was the range of voices and listenings that we put together to actually consider our story. So this was not about a technical consideration of a uh, data to find a practical solution. It was as much and probably more to be a critical reflection of the story being told by the different teams. And that's the conclusion finally we came to is not just does it add up, but does it make a persuasive story? How did we reach our result? You've heard a bit from Herr Stadler and from the others about how we proceeded, but I'll just quickly run through the process. Before we arrived here in Istanbul, the nine members of the international jury removed, um, reviewed more than 100 pages of closely written documentation, plus video footage and other documentation that had been prepared for in advance. Then this morning, we spent five hours. Firstly, we had 20 minutes face-to-face -face with each of the design teams. Then we discussed the criteria by which we would make our selection. Then we walked and spent quite a lot of time in each of the five pavilions looking in more detail at the materials. Then we gathered together to consider our final result. People like me always say that we were delighted and surprised by the quality. We were, but I think we're all passionately serious about this. There's an extraordinary amount of work has been done in a very, very kind of critical and open way, which is to me a big 90% of the story before we even found the winner. It was a fresh approach combined with a very deep investigation in all cases of the context in which these scenarios were being extrapolated. And we noticed that especially uh, the variety of people that each team had talked to in their various contexts. Superpool that you heard, a highly original online loyalty program which harnesses the power of social networks to increase the use of shared transport, thereby to reduce the presence of parked private cars and as a consequence to free up space on the back streets of this and potentially other cities for the shared social and cultural activities that we all felt should take priority. We enjoyed tremendously, secondly, the social as well as the technical innovation in the Shareway project for the Bozhuwash region of the USA by the design team of Huala and Yoon. This is an interesting combination of a basically a large, probably expensive infrastructure project, which is simultaneously socially quite radical in the shift that it proposes from individualized mobility towards shared modes in different ways. We are enchanted by the remarkable design tools and catalogues under the family name Being Nicely Messy, created by the Mumbai-based collective CRIT. For CRIT especially, mobility in the abstract is neither a positive nor a negative value. What matters, they taught us, is a city's capacity to foster valuable connections and transactions amongst diverse populations. In that spirit, their project sets out to help different stakeholders explore near future development options collaboratively rather than as now, either in opposition or not talking to each other at all. A toolkit for social connectivity. We were fascinated by the pretty radical concept of cloud logistics and the idea of burying transport infrastructures proposed by the design firm Node. Node's proposal reasserts embodied presence and sociality of people on streets that until now have been buried and polluted by the transport intensity of the world factory of the Pearl River Delta in China. Finally, urban think tank nearly got Herr Stadler dancing the samba with their celebration of movement for its own sake in both physical and social ways. Their multidimensional and multi-velocity parangular concept developed for Sao Paulo looked upwards, downwards, and at angles, as well as is traditional horizontally. In the event, to conclude, the jury selected as its overall winner a project that we found to be the most thoroughly resolved to, of the, in response to the competition brief as published. We concluded that the winner has the potential to be realized, in part at least, within the 2030 time frame prescribed by the competition. We also appreciated the winning team's thorough research into its social and economic context and the fact that it involves both social as well as technical innovation 
and at a system-wide level. It was important, too, to the jury that the real architectural quality was shown in the execution of the winning project. So I'm guessing that you want to know who that is. So at that point, I will get out of your way and hover over to Herr Sadler. John, thank you very much. The nail biting is over. This is the moment you've all been waiting for. And it's my pleasure to once again invite Mr. Stadler to the podium and announce the winner of the Audio Urban Future Award 2012. So I will do so. Ladies and gentlemen, and now I think we have come to a very exciting moment. I have the honor of presenting you with our jury's pick for this year's award. And the winning team is Hall Yoon Architecture. We have to say that we were amazed and impressed by your vision for the Boswash urban area through to 2030. These US architects continue under our view the American dream, freedom, individuality, a dream that is also embodied by mobility. And now that our jury has chosen this year's award winners, we want to see a little bit more. Their vision detailed in the so-called city dossier. Once again, congratulations. <laughs> Very good. Excellent. This is the small symbol of the Audio Urban Future Award. Sharing. Thank sharing. You. The share way. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we're humbled and delighted uh, to be selected. Uh, it's been a privilege and an incredibly interesting journey uh, to be provoked like this by both Audi and, and Style Park. Um, we enjoyed the process tremendously. Uh, it's something, it's always interesting to sort of research your own backyard. And we figured we didn't even know Boswash until we started uh, this project. Um, we, we enjoyed the, the, the camaraderie and the challenge uh, provided by the curator team. We had a fantastic team at home uh, working on this. Um, one thought I, you know, that, that was touched on earlier is that some of these problems are bigger than than architecture, they're bigger than automotive industry, they're bigger than urbanism, and, and this challenge really brought all these people together to work on a, on a, on a single goal, and that's really important. Um, thank you so much, we're, we're so moved. You're welcome, thank you.